So now it's my really distinct pleasure to introduce our next moderator, Laureen Powell Jobs. Boy, that silenced the place. Laureen is uh, founder and chair of, em of Emerson Collective, an organization that supports social entrepreneurs and organizations working in the areas of education and immigration reform, social justice, and conservation. She's an advocate for fair and just policies on behalf of underserved students. And very importantly, she's the chair of the advisory council of the Global Philanthropy Forum. Lorene will be interviewing Wendy Kopp, who is CEO and co-founder of Teach for All. So please join me in welcoming Lorene and Wendy to the stage. It's a pleasure to be back here at the Global Philanthropy Forum. And it's my distinct honor to be in conversation today with Wendy Kopp, one of my heroes on the planet, and one of the great entrepreneurs in any sector. The social sector is lucky to have her. Um, I've known Wendy for at least a decade when she was running Teach for America, and then as she transitioned to Teach for All. So I'd love to start the conversation off with Teach for America, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, when you look back over 25 years, how do you evaluate the impact of Teach for America? Well, the big idea of Teach for America, you know, I think some people hear Teach for America and they think two years of teaching, but as you well know, it's really not about, I mean, the two years are really crucial, but it's really about every year thereafter. The big idea is really to say, you know, we need to be channeling our country's most promising future leaders. We need to channel their energy against one of our most absolutely fundamental issues, which is that still in this country, where kids are born determines their educational prospects and in turn, life prospects. And we know that that issue is a deeply systemic, complicated issue. There is no one answer. So much has to be done to solve that problem. And the big question in our minds is, who is going to do all this? Who is going to figure out how to structure schools and structure systems and take the pressure off of schools in the first place by improving social services and health services and all of the, you know, how do we get at all of that? And, and that's really what Teach for America is trying to do, right, is to say, okay, we're going to cultivate over time, you know, the leadership capacity necessary to take on, you know, all the various dimensions of the issue. And so, you know, I think we do have an advantage here in this country versus in some of these other countries where this model is just getting off the ground because we can actually look at communities where we've been placing a steady stream of folks for now, in some cases, 23 or 24 years and ask ourselves, is it making any difference? Like, is there anything different going on in these communities? Um, and actually, I'll, because we're here in the Bay Area, actually, yesterday I was in Los Angeles and was just reflecting there about where things were 25 years ago, 24 years ago when we placed the first core, where they are now. And honestly, despite how many people feel very embattled in Los Angeles as we push the boulder up the hill to address this issue, we've made dramatic progress. And if you took all the Teach for America alumni out of the picture, you would take away a lot of the energy and leadership that's driven the change. But now we're in the Bay Area. This is a picture of Oakland. Um, so was Oakland one of your original communities? It was in the second year. So we've been placing teachers in Oakland for 22 years. Uh -huh. um, and how many teachers per year do you place and what percentage? Oh gosh, they it's varied more so much. Um, from year to year, but I'm guessing between 30 and 50 people. So it's not, mm -hmm. you know, it's not been a huge placement site, but we've had a steady stream of 30 to 50 incoming teachers uh -huh. for this long. Um, so what I think is interesting is to first look at, so this is 1999. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the California way of ranking schools, this is a map of what Oakland looked like. And as you can see, almost all of the schools on this map are red, which means they're in the lowest category of, Oak, of um, California's Academic performance index. API index. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just to fast forward, this is what it looks like today. So we're moving from red to yellow to blue to green. Yeah. 
this is not to say, of course, I mean, not, not to say this is because of Teach for America, right? Like many, many things happened to contribute to the progress that took us from 1999 to, you know, 2012. Um, you know, we've had many committed educators going at it and political leaders and philanthropists and many people, you know, doing many, many things to try to move the needle. But as you really get to Oakland and you spend time there, um, what you realize is that if you took all the Teach for America alumni out of the picture, you would take away a lot of the energy and leadership that has driven the change. Um, you know, one of the things that when happened- you have, Sorry to interrupt, but do you have a sense of what what the teachers ended up doing. Some obviously yeah. stay in the teaching profession, some become school leaders. Do they yeah. generally stay in the community and, and have their experience in, inform the rest of their career within the community? Yeah, so, well, overall, there are 33,000 Teach for America alumni across the country, and two-thirds of them are working full-time in education. And of the other third who leave, uh -huh. Half of them have jobs that relate in some way to schools or low-income communities. So if you go back to Oakland, you realize, if you pull together the TFA alums in Oakland, you realize some of them have been teaching in Oakland for 20 years. You realize that 20% of the schools in Oakland have either a principal or assistant principal who's a Teach for America alum. Um, and if you trace the history, you realize how did we get from 1999 to you know, 2012 in terms of those results? You know, it took the alumni of Teach for America who went out and started the first kind of lighthouse schools that really showed people what was mm -hmm. possible, that we could provide kids in low-income communities with a truly transformational education. Schools like Think College Now or or like the school called Lighthouse. Um, then it took you know, a, T a Teach for America alum named Hayson Kim saying, I'm gonna go inside the system mm -hmm. and create the conditions that made it possible for folks to start these charter schools, but within the system, like creating this kind of autonomous zone of small schools. Mm -hmm. um, it took someone you know, bringing the new teacher project to Oakland and saying, we're gonna use the kind of strategies Teach for America uses to recruit and select and, and support teachers, but we're gonna do it by recruiting local folks in Oakland according, you know, and, and selecting them through high standards. It took another alum to say, we're gonna bring new leaders to Oakland so that we can kind of transform the recruitment and selection and development of the school principals there. It took a collection of, of TFA alums saying, we're gonna create an advocacy organization that brings together the educators, the more privileged folks in this community and the constituents of our work, the, the parents of the kids uh -huh. we're working with together to advocate for the policy changes necessary to get where we're trying to go. So, so they, they, overall, they're they, doing so many things. Right. They're teaching, they're running schools, they're working And the power the of the ripple effect to build out the ecosystem for change is really that, that alumni pool that no matter what they end up doing, they start transforming community because of their grounding as teachers in the classroom. Exactly. And it's, it's just the fact that they come in, they come in unsuspecting. They're thinking they're gonna do this for two years. Right. And they pour their hearts and souls into and it. And it changes their lives. They fall in love with their kids. And they realize, first of all, they're, they realize the potential their kids have but they, they become kind of outraged by the fact that they really don't have the chance to fulfill that potential. And you can't leave it once you've kind of experienced yeah, it's, that. It's, it's rather like the veil lifting, and once you see that, you have to devote yeah. your life to it. So they come out of it believing a couple things. I mean, they come in, they're a very diverse group, they have diverse political views, but they share a couple of perspectives at the end of this. One is they realize, actually, we can solve this problem because they've seen in the microcosm of their classroom mm -hmm. that when you meet kids who face all these extra challenges with high expectations and provide extra support to them, they excel. So they realize we can do this, and they secondly have just a very grounded understanding of what it's gonna take. So while many people in the world, it seems, are still lurching after one silver bullet solution after another, they come out of it thinking, you know what, there's no one thing. It's gonna take doing so much so well. And that's just a really, and, and they have real insight into what it's gonna take. And we need more and more and more leaders. And, and hopefully many of them will come from Teach for America and many of them will come from many other sources, but we need as many leaders as we can get who are on fire about the fact that we can reach the point where all kids have the, poten you know, the opportunity to fulfill their true potential and who have a very grounded understanding of what it's gonna take to get there. Fantastic. 
Um, and just so everybody knows, just fast forward us to today, Teach for America places, is it generally 5,000 teachers a year in the classroom, so the yeah. cohorts are 10,000 large? Yeah. And talk about the recruitment process. So each year now, between 50 and 60,000 people apply to Teach for America. Um, Wait, 50 to 60,000. Yeah, and between five and 6,000 come into the core. There are 11,000 teachers right now across 49 urban and rural uh -huh. communities. Um, yeah. And, and, and one of the things. But that's to pretty say, amazing to think. And, and Teach for America, I don't know if they still are, but they used to be the largest employer of recent college grads in the country. Is that still the truth? It, it, other than maybe Enterprise Rent-A-Car. <laughs> but in terms of bringing folks in, I think that's actually accurate, but um, who just meet such, you know, these are folks who are turning down incredible grad schools and incredible corporate offers and various other offers yeah. and saying, I want to do this for, for two years. And to think that, you know, every year we are channeling really about 6,000 of our country's most promising folks into the Oaklands and the Newark, New Jerseys and the Mississippi Deltas of the world and that that experience is so transformative for them. And the, the last thing mm -hmm. I'll just say is in our entire first decade, we brought in 5,000 people. So the fact that we're now bringing in 6,000 people every yeah. year means that, you know, where will we be five years from now, 10 years from now? Mm -hmm. If you go to Oakland right now, they have, you know, we are nowhere near where we need to be in Oakland. Um, but. I really believe we're going to get there, and we'll get there for because of many people and, and many things. But if you start talking with these TFA alums, you realize they are working from every level. We can't solve this problem from within classrooms alone. That's the problem, right? So we've got many of them still teaching, but you know, it, and that's amazing. But it's also great that some of them are saying, "Okay, fine, I'm going to run for school board, or I'm going to, you know." maybe pursue union leadership, actually, because uh -huh. people are everything. We can bring this entire problem within our control if we have enough people working at it from inside and outside the system. Um, that's really optimistic. <laughs> uh, and just, just the notion of 60,000 uh, highly educated recent college grads wanting to become teachers is really exciting yep. for our country. Um, so let, so even though there is a lot of work that still needs to be done in the United States, you decided to transition out of Teach for America. So talk to us a little bit about that. Succession is always tricky, especially when a founder transitions out. So how did you navigate your transition? How did, how did you decide it was time to go? And then how did you navigate through Teach for America into Teach for All? I mean, I may have to back up just a bit because what happened here was Actually, I was just fully focused on the U.S. There's so much more to be done here. You can see every day juxtaposed against each other how much more needs to be done and real evidence mm -hmm. of the possibility of kind of winning this if we stay the course. So I was thinking about nothing but this country. The, the issue was that there was something in the water about eight or nine years ago. And within one year, I met 13 incredibly compelling people from 13 different countries, from India to Lebanon to Chile to the next place, who made their way to my office and said, we have to start Teach for India, and we're hoping you can help us. So it felt like you know, the responsible thing to do to help these folks. Um, and you know, one thing led to so just another. ad hoc, you started mentoring it. Other well, and, and then it became clear this is going to become really overwhelming, which led us to realize let's approach this more strategically. Mm -hmm. and, and it led ultimately to the launch of a separate organization, actually about seven years ago now, called Teach for All, whose mission is to accelerate the impact of this model around the world. But it's really a network of independent, locally led and funded organizations in all these different countries. What I realized, though, um, is that that initial idea that we were going to help them was a really limited conception of what the potential was here, um, because you know I, I very quickly realized that you know these are brilliant people all over the world mm -hmm. who, you know, 
are innovating and doing incredible things with this model. And it just became clear that, you know, if we could create a global network where we're all learning from each other, all of us will move forward more quickly. So I think it was, you know, honestly, in the last five years, we had, had doubled Teach for America's scale while at the same time going from nothing to, you know, now 34 countries at, across the Teach for All network. Um, and it just became clear that something had to be done. Like there, I was not going and to be able to give to run it. Teach for America all that it needed and Teach for All all that it needed. And mm -hmm. so that led um, me to step back with you know, some of the folks on the Teach for America board to really just reflect on, and, and some of the folks on the Teach for All board to reflect on what needed to happen here. And, and I came to believe that um, given how much strength and capacity we've built up at Teach for America over time, that um, it would be great to unleash some of that energy um, and, and appoint new leadership at Teach for America. Um, and, you know, at the same time, freeing myself up to, you know, spend all the more energy to ensure that we really fulfill the potential of the global work. Well, I should mention, though, that not only were you running uh, arguably the most important nonprofit organization in the ed sector in the United States, but you're also a mother to four kids, and now you're taking on a global organization. So how did, how did you decide to do that? And did I, do you still think you're crazy for doing it? And by the way, her husband is the leader of KIPP. So they both have incredible, incredible schedules. Um, well, you know what? Honestly, I was really, really angsting about this question. And someone sent this man, Fazal Abed, who's probably known to oh, many of you all, um, to me, and I had, I'd never met him. I had a three hour dinner with him one night, and I was really like at that point, and I, I said to him finally at the end of the dinner, I said, can I just ask you one more question? Like, you're saying you're a grandfather, so you have kids. Like, do you think I can do this? Like, I've got four small kids, and, and he, he was just immediate. He's like, of course. <laughs> and he imparted this incredible wisdom about, wait a minute, you know, w you need to do this, but that doesn't mean you have to travel every day. Of course, I am now traveling every day. But as he said, it would all, it would all work out. So sometimes you just need those people to come into your life. And instead of saying, oh, no, be careful, say, yes, go for it. And is I, everybody in this room knows him, uh, who he is. Uh, did he remain a mentor for you through this process? He's incredible. You know, he, he, yes, um, he, he, he absolutely has been. And beyond that, you know, he understands this model. I think there's something kind of counterintuitive about what we're doing. You know, mm -hmm. you know, if you think you can't understand this as a way to address the issue around quality of teaching, most people think that's what we're doing, is not what we're doing. What we're doing, again, is trying to build leadership capacity in all these countries around the world. Mm -hmm. And from his own work in Bangladesh initially and, and now around the world, he's just come to believe that leadership development is so crucial, which is one of the reasons he was saying, you must go do this. It's because he was um, seeing it firsthand. Yeah. But um, maybe you can just set the stage for everyone and talk a little bit about global education issues and the migration, again, of high capacity and IQ into the sector uh, and where, how Teach for All then has been built over the last couple of yep. years. So two big things that I feel like we've learned over the last couple of, or seven, seven now years in this. Um, you know, one is that I mean, there were huge questions at the front end of this about whether this model that has played out in the way it has here in the US and also in the UK, in the UK there's yeah. an organization called Teach First, which has had just incredible success, the largest graduate recruiter, incredible results during the two years, similar alumni impacts beyond. Um, but would this work in, in very different places? And I have to say, it's been a very affirming seven years, first of all, there's something magnetic about this model in terms of its ability to attract talent. Um, a thousand people applied for Teach for Pakistan's first 40 spots. Uh, 2,400 people applied last year for Enseñapur, Colombia's 60 spots. This year, 13,000 people applied for Teach for India's 500 spots. And when you start meeting the folks they're selecting, you realize these are just incredible hearts and minds and mm. souls all over the world, just incredible people drawn to this. 
We've seen very similar impacts during the two years, the initial studies that you know, IEDB has done uh, on Enseña Chile or that Columbia University is uh -huh. doing with the Teach for India show, significant positive impact for kids. But maybe the most just, you know, affirming thing is to see the same alumni effects. We're seeing 50 to 70 percent of the teachers across the network deciding, and they come in equally unsuspecting as the Teach for America people. That thinking, their lives are about to change. They're just, they're thinking they're just going to do this yeah. for two years. But 50 to 70 percent of them s decide to stay in education long term at the end of their two year commitment thus far. And you start spending time with them and you realize they are on fire and they are already launching, you know, some of the early TFA alums launched the KIPP academies and launched the new teacher project and started we saw the signs early on and we see similar signs all over the world they're starting social enterprises they're becoming school principals at ridiculously young ages they're getting employed by big governments and I, I was just in Peru and 20 percent of the first cohort are now working in the Ministry of Education oh wow um, so we're seeing that this model really is it, it resonates everywhere I really believe that in almost every country of the world we will soon have one day have programs that are channeling their top talent against this this problem mm. in a way that ultimately you know generates and fuels broader movements to ensure educational opportunity for all so that's one thing we learned mm. but the other big thing I mean again I started out in this thinking I need to be so aware all these countries are so different there are going to be huge limitations in the applicability well, there are of the lessons language learned and cultural yeah and, and of course and the so world you would think that perhaps the American model shouldn't necessarily be applied in um, every other country exactly right and so how how have you tweaked the models or haven't you well, the interesting thing, so we set this up in a way that it really relies on these local social entrepreneurs mm -hmm. developing a vision for adapting this model and, and the core unifying principles to their context. So there's a lot of adaptation going on. Mm -hmm. And yet, I think what becomes clear every time we bring them together and every time I go out to their countries is that you know, this problem that we're addressing here in the U.S. looks very similar all around the world. All around the world, socioeconomic background predicts educational outcomes and in turn life outcomes. And when you get into it, you realize that there are remarkable similarities in the huh. nature of that problem, meaning the mindsets, the policies, the practices that fuel the whole thing. Yes. And therefore, what that means is that the solutions are shareable. Mm -hmm. And that is the core insight that has us just so fired up about the potential of this. Because I think we're going to ultimately have you know, a global learning platform, you know, a, a network of organizations channeling top talent against this problem. They're going to be innovating because of the diversity yeah. of context and culture, but as part of a global network where they're sharing solutions. And, and that's what I think will really accelerate progress. So um, in the network of Teach for All, how, do they, how is the learning happening across countries? And then what are some of the learnings that, that you've brought back to Teach for America? Because I know that, that you were talking about that another time, that actually Teach yeah. for America has been enhanced through the learnings across the world. No, it's really, it's really true. I mean, the role of Teach for All itself is to foster that learning, like to essentially create a learning platform. And we do that through, we have these regional hubs of specialists who you know, are capturing the best practices and, and working with the local folks to ensure that they understand the lessons learned, but, but at the same time to help them think about how to adapt that in smart ways. But maybe most importantly, we're bringing people together uh -huh. virtually and in person to share these experiences. And I actually think maybe I should pull a couple. Let me bring this to life just, uh -huh. just through a couple of real world stories. This is a classic Teach for India classroom. This is actually, you can't really see her, but the founder of Teach for India, Shaheen Mistri, In the had for 17 years run these incredible after school programs in Mumbai and Pune and had become frustrated with the limitations of after school programs for making up for what happens in the school day. So mm -hmm. ultimately launched Teach for India. Mm -hmm. Now, so she brought this rich history, I mean, incredible, incredibly successful after school program. So she read the Teach for America training curriculum and Teach for All doesn't say you must use this by any means. It just says, here's what Teach for America has developed. So you need to figure out what makes sense in India. She read it and was just like, wow. 
Teach for America figured out how, what it takes to work with low-income kids. It's like this resonates so much. So she took a lot of that, but then she adapted it. And one thing she did was, you know, while Teach for America had gone down a path of training its teachers with heavy kind of skill and knowledge development, she decided, you know what, we're going to have 30% of this training just be all about mindsets. So for example, she took huh. all the first Teach for India fellows and said for a day, you're gonna sort trash because that's the most common job of the parents of the kids you're uh -huh. gonna be working with. And they came out of that thinking, okay, I gotta figure out how to put my kids on a path to greater professional options, you know? And we saw incredible results. You know, we saw that a greater percentage of their people were what we would call truly transformational teachers were just on a mission to put their kids on a different trajectory. Teach for America sent 50 of their trainer training staff over to India and they came back and if you looked at Teach for America's teacher training today you would see it looks you know, very they, different. So how did they change it here? They did what Teach for India has done. They, they created much more experiential kind of within activities, you know, yeah, within the communities mm -hmm. um, to, to develop mindsets. But another quick thing here. So actually, the teacher in this picture was a student in one of those after-school programs, but she went to college, graduated, joined Teach for India, mm -hmm and is now an alum of Teach for India. She's teaching in the first KIPP-inspired school in the slums of Mumbai, um, which was started by another Teach for India alum from the first cohort who had come to one of the conferences where we bring cohorts of the kind of leaders among the teachers from all these different programs together mm -hmm. to really immerse themselves in what's possible. There are 250 kids in this school. It's in its second year. They are recruited from truly the, the streets of Mumbai, and they're reading, writing, and speaking in English by the time they're in first grade. It's, it's pretty wow. incredible. This is a picture of their- Did you take these photos by the I did, <laughs> in my <laughs> world tour, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yesterday. We could go, I mean, we don't need no, to I go wanna, through I, all No, I, I wanna see. Well, I, I was, I mean, do. the one thing to say, this is not that great a picture, but this is just, you know, some of the team members of, of the Teach for India team, and the reason I took it and stuck it in here is because I was actually there, I mean, just, just a few weeks ago, actually, because they were at their fifth year, and they had gone through this whole strategic planning retreat where they were reflecting on the lessons learned and the path forward, and I was just blown away by where they are. And while there's much to be improved about, you know, we're constantly trying to get better at Teach for All, I have to say I, it was very reflective of the fact that I feel like we're walking a, a solid line between, a strong line between kind of fostering, building the local capacity. I mean, mm -hmm. they own this and they are brilliant and they have charted a path forward that is so compelling. And at the same time, it's deeply informed by what has been learned, not only at Teach for America and Teach First, but in Enseña Peru and all over the world. I mean, really, if you, if you really know this stuff and you look at their plan forward, you just realize, wow. I mean, it's deep learnings from India and deep learnings from around the world. And this has been developed by a team that truly, truly has full ownership and a powerful vision for building an unstoppable movement in India. That's so exciting. Yeah. And what are some of the other um, assistance and technical assistance and capacity building um, strengths that the network brings? So I, I wonder if people are kind of curious about the adjunct that the Teach for All Network gives to each one of these leaders while they're, they're learning and deepening yeah. their practice within the country, but also sharing it across yeah. their peer group. Well, it starts, so right now we're working with 40 early stage social entrepreneurs who are pursuing this in their countries and haven't launched a program that's part of Teach for All. So, they're out there and we're trying to help them deeply understand the model. So we'll bring them together in one of these partner countries and help them become really immersed in how this actually works. And you can mm -hmm. imagine that takes more than one sitting. I mean, it's just very complex, but we work to really deeply orient them to this. And then we help them um, figure out how to build the support of their governments, their private sectors, how to build the capacity to launch an aligned program. So once they're ready to launch, and if they're, they've truly built the support and the capacity to launch a program that is aligned to our kind of unifying principles, then we bring them into the network. And at that point, we basically do four things to support them. Mm -hmm. One is just direct support 
from these regionally based specialists in all the major areas, like how to recruit and select teachers, how to train and develop them, how to foster alumni leadership, how to build strong organizations, how to build public and private sector support. The second is around direct connections at the staff level, the teacher level, and the alumni level, virtually and in person. The third is around contributing to their leadership development. Like this morning at 4 a.m. my time, because I thought I was gonna be on the East Coast when this was scheduled, I was on a phone call with the CEOs from all across the network and an incredible woman who's just an expert in building strong leadership teams you know, doing a one hour session on, you know, how do we tackle the biggest challenges we face across the network and building strong leadership teams, you know? So mm -hmm. contributing to the leadership development of the staff, the, the teachers and the alums across the network. And finally, accessing global resources for the benefit of the partners. So like, everyone shouldn't be reinventing the wheel on how to structure a Salesforce database that makes sense mm -hmm. for this model. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've got multiple kind of partnerships on, on that front. So other than India, what are some of the bright spots across the network that surprised you and, yeah. and which countries are far more challenging than you expected? Um, and have you exited any countries? So, you know, I have to say I can never pick because there is strength all across the network and there is challenge all across the network. Uh -huh. So, um, but, but just to bring to light. So maybe a better question is what are, what are some of the particular challenges that aren't universally shared in, in particular countries? You know, there are different challenges clearly between very developed contexts and very underdeveloped contexts. Um, you know, and so, you know, you think about the challenges of launching this model and expanding it in Germany, where there is a very deeply established regulatory environment governing how people become teachers and such, versus in, say, a Nepal, um, which I'm dying to show you these pictures. This is the founder of Teach for Nepal, but this is a view outside the classrooms, and this is one of the first fellows of, in Nepal. But, you know, it's a much more open regulatory environment, so much easier to get these teachers into classrooms, but at the same time, really hard to figure out how do you access the financial support to truly scale this model. Um, so it, it's just a range of challenges that has to do with, you know, again, the, you know, the diversity across, across contexts. So as you build out the network, how do you balance breadth across the network, adding in more countries and, and depth within each of the countries because um, I imagine that the ambition to scale within country is ripe within each one of these entrepreneurs because that's yeah. what they do is create and build. I mean, we have taken the approach of wanting to be inclusive of every social entrepreneur who is, truly has a vision and has built the local support to launch a program that is truly aligned to this model because we wanna be contributing to those entrepreneurs' impact and we wanna be learning from them. So that's our hope, is to be able to continue to steadily grow at the pace that people are ready to launch these programs. Um, once they come in, the whole challenge is how do we help them get much bigger and much better? Um, and I do think we've built a model with many economies of scale. So we have a regional hub and the more programs that come in in that region, they start supporting each other directly. And so we, we think we're on a path uh -huh. to being able to, to actually scale this without, um, you know, and, and, and at the same time ensure, as you say, deepening impact um, as well. Um, I have so many more questions, but I know, unfortunately, we're out of time. We do have some musical treat that's coming right after us, but I want to take this time to just thank Wendy so much. Uh, if, she could be, if she could be one of the first cloning experiments, I think everyone would vote for that because <laughs> she's, she just blows me away every time I hear her speak. Thank you so well, thank much. Thank you, and Laurie, for the great so work you're much. Doing. Thank you. And now a musical interlude by Emmy Award winning composer Gary Malkin. Now a chance for your ripe brains to be bathed a bit. The 
comes a time when you can't sit by while people hunger while children cry the world is calling for you to give from the part of you that always lives our busy lives make it seem so hard There's always someone in your own backyard. They cry for mercy and tenderness from the part of you that knows what's best. Teach a friend to read, hold the old man's hand. The rivers help save the land. The world is calling for you to give a part of you that will always live. and friends to read we're holding the old man's hand we're saving the rivers we're cleaning the lands the world is calling for us to give from the part of you that will always live will always live.